Good morning, and welcome to today's webinar on international inter, anti-racism in international education, two extremely important topics, and being addressed in, uh, I think, a novel and new and very significant way. This webinar is sponsored by two University of California Berkeley entities, the Center for Studies in Higher Education and the Berkeley Interna International Group, BIG. We have on this very important topic, which we'll cover in depth, intercultural competence and that's relationship to anti-racism, which I believe is a core concept that needs more and more exploration. I'm Margaret Heisel, Senior Research Associate at the Center for Studies in Higher Education at Berkeley. Uh, our speakers are first, Harvey Charles. Harvey is Professor of International Education in the Department of Educational Policy and Leadership at the State University of New York, Albany. And Harvey has been Chief International Officer at several other universities, including Northern Arizona, San Francisco State, Georgia Tech, Wheaton College, and Harvey also has published extensively on the subject of higher education over the years. Darla Deardoff has also agreed to join us. Darla is Executive Director of the Association of International Educators, which of course is a well-known national professional organization, which is based at Duke University, where Darla is also a research scholar in education and the founder of ICC Global, which is a global network of intercultural competence research right on target. Darla has also served as visiting faculty at universities all around the world. I'm impressed with that, Darla. And Karen Fisher, our moderator, is senior writer at the Chronicle of Higher Education for Higher Education, and she is its chief international correspondent. She covers international education, the globalization of higher edu education and colleges and business. Karen now will describe for you very quickly the webinar format, and how you can submit questions during the webinar. And with that, I say, shall we begin, Karen? Thanks, Harvey, Margaret. Darla? <laughs> We're ready to go. <laughs> ready to go. Thanks, everybody. I'm glad that so many of you could um, take a break from uh, scrolling uh, CNN in 538, and uh, we hope to provide you with a good distraction from a uh, the election, at least for an hour today. Yes. Um, I think, as Margaret said, this is a really important topic. Um, you know, I've been thinking about it myself a lot in my reporting and um, Darla and Harvey have been doing a lot of, of great work. And so um, I want to dive in and spend most of this time on, a on the conversation between us, but um, just a couple of very quick housekeeping things. Um, you'll see, I think on the right hand side of your screen, there's a comment function. We really encourage you, um, many of you did send in um, questions um, when you signed up for the webinar um, and we have, um, we've collected all of those and we'll be asking some of them, but we certainly encourage you to, to submit additional ones and we'll be um, keeping an eye on those. Um, we also want you to think of that chat um, space as, as a, a place to, to, to have a chat. I mean, Darla and Harvey are, are certainly experts, but we know that many of you are doing interesting um, things on your own campuses and you can be resources for each other. And we really encourage you to, to do that. Um, I think also we'll be sharing um, some of the materials, some of the articles that Dar Darla and Harvey and I have written there as well. And we hope that they can be useful to you. Um, I also just wanted to um, say we've gotten some questions about this. Um, this is being recorded, so if you have colleagues who couldn't make it, if you've got to, to break away and, and, and um, do other things, this will be, um, be available after and you'll be able to listen to it. Um, so finally, I just want to thank our sponsors, the Berkeley Center for Studies in Higher Education and the Berkeley International Group um, for bringing us together and for sponsoring and organizing uh, today. Um, with that, let, let's really get into the conversation. Um, so Darla and Harvey, you wrote a really interesting piece um, uh, in Times Higher Ed, and you were talking about how kind of traditionally uh, a lot of anti-racism work has been kind of the province of diversity and inclusion offices. 
Um, yet there really is intersection and overlap with some of the intercultural and cross-cultural work that, that you know, we, those of, of many of you who are in the international education offices engage with all the time in your work. And so I wonder if, if each of you could talk a little bit about what you see as areas of commonality, but just as importantly, are there clear differences and distinctions we should be taking into account when we talk about race, anti-racism and the role international educators can play? Darla, do you want to start? <laughs> I, I can, sure. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks very much to Margaret and to the center and, and, and Karen and, and, uh, and Harvey. It's, it's really great to be here with you all today. And um, you know, we're, we're all learning in this together around um, anti-racism. And so we're just here to kind of help provide some food for thought as, as we go through some of the questions that you all have posed. But certainly, um, Several years ago, the American Council uh, on Education had done some, some really great work around looking at the intersections between diversity and, and international education. And if, if you were to set up a, a kind of Venn diagram, the areas of overlap between the two are really around intercultural competence, that that's, that's really where the two are linked. Um, and so, and, the, and for those who may know, that's been the area of my research and work. Um, and so, I think that's where we really need to focus our efforts collectively, while at the same time, as you said, recognizing that, that the, the traditions and histories and contexts are really very different, and it's important to understand that. But, but looking at what is it that we really share in common that we can really work on together and focus on, and it is around that intercultural competence piece. Um, and we can certainly unpack that more as we go through the conversation. Harvey, over to you. Yeah, um, I, I would I would echo what you've said in saying that uh, we have uh, we are learning as we go along. I mean, I come to this uh, subject not as an expert on race by any means, but as a person of color who has been immersed in international education for a very long time, and it has always occurred to me that. Um, there is much more that our field uh, in international education can do with uh, professionals in the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion space. And sadly, um, I think to the extent that you find these kinds of collaborations, it's been the exception and not the rule. Um, I have believed that um, international education is the flip side of um, anti-racist work or diversity work. Um, I think that there are a lot of uh, chief diversity officers who see diversity work um, within the context of universities and colleges in the United States as having a very domestic focus, focus uh, on issues of race, for example, um, while international educators have typically seen their province as related to international kinds of things outside of the United States. And, you know, uh, I have sensed that um, chief diversity officers um, and international educators have not felt that they can bridge these two areas because the focus um, has been so different. And yet, um, I think uh, as Darla has suggested, when we look at intercultural competence, both of these arenas come together. Um, and in fact, I would add that um, issues of race, in my view, is a subset of issues of inequality. And the reality is that we, we, th there are multiple instances of inequality all over the world. In fact, it is a feature of, 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 uh, of humanity, if you will. And while it is true that racism is global, th that's absolutely true, but inequality is a bigger um, dimension, if you will, and, and it includes race as one of the ways in which inequality is manifested. And so I believe that there are many, many opportunities for uh, professionals um, in international education and diversity, equity, and, and inclusion to collaborate in order to continue to shine a spotlight or to be more effective in shining a spotlight on anti-racism work. Um, I, when, I, when I was especially looking at some of the questions people had submitted, I felt like a lot of them fell into one of two buckets, which is what can international educators do 
um, within their own space, working with the populations that they're, you know, meant to, to focus on. So international students, study abroad exchange students, scholars, and the like. And then how can they be good campus partners? And I wonder if we could start with the, the latter a bit and talk about ways in which you might see international educators bringing some of their own work and their own expertise and engaging across the, the campus on, on issues of anti-racism. Yeah, that, that, go ahead, Harvey. <laughs> okay, um, about 10 years ago, I, I, I launched an initiative at Northern Arizona University known as a Global Learning Initiative. And um, the idea was that departments would come forward and um, uh, kind of propose a plan to develop global learning outcomes for um, the, um, the discipline and for the courses uh, within uh, each of those majors. And I remember having a conversation with a group of faculty and the, um, the chair of theater said to me, um, I, don't, I don't see how we can do global learning outcomes in a discipline like theater. That just doesn't seem to, to, to go, to jive. And um, um, to make a long story short, um, after about three to four months, when she had an opportunity to meet with her faculty to talk about global learning um, it, 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 as it applies to the discipline of theater, it turned out that their recommendations um, were among the strongest of all of the departments that uh, participated in this program. And the point I'm trying to make here is that we're never sure um, what we could necessarily accomplish on a particular initiative without first having a conversation. And so I think the first order of business is to bring a group of like-minded people, people who feel strongly committed to the issues of um, anti-racism in a domestic and a global context to come together, to strategize. We, you can call it a strategic planning if you like, but, uh, but bringing people together to, um, to find ways in which um, a strategy can be implemented um, and, and, and um, 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 played out uh, within the context of an institution that can respond to um, the real needs in that institution and help to move the conversation fo uh, forward. Let's keep in mind that um, uh, this is not a work that you do um, tomorrow or you do next week and then you're done with it. It is ongoing work. So, Darla? Uh yeah, I just want to pick up on Harvey's point. I think that's really a key point about it. it's a commitment. It's not just a tick box. We've, we've talked about this. We've met with a colleague across campus. We're done. But this really needs to be a very serious commitment, and it needs to be very intentional um, in terms of reaching out to others uh, on our uh, campuses at our institutions. And you know, international educators often talk about the local and the global. But let's really focus a bit more on the local and say, who do we need to connect with? Who are the stakeholders? Um, and who do we need to learn from? And, and so it can be a mutual learning. Yes, international educators have some of this expertise around intercultural competence and global learning, but also what can we learn from others um, at our institutions and how can we bring them into the conversation as Harvey said, and be intentional about actually making those conversations happen. For example, so at AIA, we work with senior international officers, those who are leading internationalization efforts on their campuses. And oftentimes there's a international advisory council that they put together. So to what extent would that council include persons from, from the equity, diversity, uh, inclusion lens? Uh, who else needs to be included on that council to really be able to connect the local and the global? Um, and and I've, I've increasingly seen this uh, acronym around JEDI, which adds justice to it, justice, equity, uh, diversity, and inclusion, to, to really look at this through a kind of a social justice lens and, and examine all that we do through that, who else needs to be brought in and including our students. And really, you know, which students are we listening to? Who are we inviting in? Whose voices count? Um, whose voices are missing that we need to include um, in these conversations and in our work? And I think those are all really important questions to explore further. Uh, you, let me have, uh, quickly I'm add, I'm sorry, that, that um, the point of departure in addressing uh, these issues cannot be what programs can we 
um, adopt and implement on our campus. That simply cannot be the point of departure when we're talking about racism. Let us not forget uh, racism, as many people have characterized it, is the original sin. It has been with us for centuries. Um, and uh, um, so we cannot assume that we are necessarily equipped to pursue programs, to launch programs without recognizing that there is work that has to do, has to be done um, as individuals. Um, Sad Guru, who is a, a yogi and author and um, well known, I think, in, uh, internationally, talks about inner engineering. Uh, we could also talk about internal renovation, if you will. Every professional, every international educator, every uh, professional in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space has to reckon with, contend with um, the issue of, 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 of race and what it means um, in terms of my own identity as a human being and my own identity as a professional. Um, we, I'm sure that many in the audience are familiar with the issue of unconscious bias. All right, and there are dozens of workshops and, and uh, seminars on this on this uh, on this topic. Well, um, it is bias that's operating un unconsciously, feelings that we may have about a social group that affects decision making, um, even when we are unaware of it. Um, and this bias can be it tends to be triggered automatically, and it it actually goes uh, contrary to the position, to the beliefs, to the attitudes that we may actually articulate out loud. Well, um, to the extent that we're committed in engaging in anti-racist work as an international educator, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's really critical that we do um, work, internal work, and ask and, 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 and engage with issues of who we are as individuals and how we understand ourselves as, professional, um, as professionals. Uh, it's critical to understand that there are a lot of international educators who think of this work only in terms of delivering services. And they fail to reckon with the realization that international education fundamentally is about educating. It is about engaging in, um, in ways with faculty and students that can bring about transformation in their lives, that can help them to prepare for um, a world that is incredibly interconnected and interdependent. And so I think, you know, before we talk about actual strategies, and there are a number of them, I think it is first important to recognize that there is internal work that has to be done as we attempt to engage with this important uh, agenda. And Harvey, I would say that that even goes into, again, what we were saying earlier, not just, uh, okay, I've done this work, I'm ready, but it's something we do every day, um, right. particularly those of us who are um, privileged um, for various reasons, that we need to really do this work every day and really look at in some ways, almost looking at the lifestyle we lead, it's 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 part of it should be part of who we are and how we go about it. Like you said, not just a something we do once or address through a program, but it it needs to become who we are. As you said, it's the identity and and how are we engaging uh, with that around particularly anti-racism, um, particularly some of the work that's come out recently, Ibram X Kendi's work on anti-racism and so on. It's there's no neutral place to be. You're either racist or you're not. And if you're not, you're anti-racist. You need to be taking action um, in, 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 in starting with ourselves in our daily life, um, questioning policies and procedures and, and structures and, and how are we doing that? So it needs to be something that we live every day um, and that we wrestle with every day. And, and, and it's something that we're going to, we're not going to get, some of us not going to get right. We're going to make mistakes. But we keep wrestling with it and keep struggling with it and seeing how, how is it that I am actually racist in some of my behaviors and actions and how, what can I do differently to, to become better at that? And what actions can I take? Mm -hmm. I, I take the point that both of you are making that this is, this is very much a marathon. It's not a sprint. This is, is ongoing work. But I think people also feel a lot of urgency to do it. And I wonder, I mean, it, it's such a big challenge. How, I mean, even in your own lives, how have you begun doing, how did you begin doing it? What were, are there, were there questions that you, you found or approaches to sort of doing that internal work that, 
that you think are useful um, and in, could inform how other people begin to to tackle this 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 task as well. Well, I, I think it's important to approach life with a critical lens, you know, and um, and one of the reasons that I um, began to notice that this connects in, 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 in my field in international education was precisely because I started um, applying a critical lens. Um, I think we all understand that um, international education is overwhelmingly white, all right? And, um, you know, I've been in the field for 30 years and you know, it, 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 it wasn't difficult for me as a person of color to notice that. Um, but of course, um, when you look at issues of hiring, for example, um, and you know, I recently uh, published a, a piece in, in the International Educator on this around hiring, you know, th that in my mind is, is one, of the, one of the important steps we need to take to address um, systemic racism. Um, so to the extent that we talk about dismantling the um, um, racist structures, this is one of the structures, one of the systemic things that can be addressed. Um, and um, uh, what kinds of affirmative things can we do to ensure that we have um, a staff that is diverse, not only in terms of race, but also in terms of gender, sexual orientation, age, um, you name it. Um, and I think that to the extent that we are willing to uh, apply a critical lens to how we lead our work, um, we can be quite effective in, in uncovering um, these ways uh, by which racist practices um, are perpetuated. I mean, keep in mind that we live in a racist uh, country, in a racist world, and white supremacy is the ideology that drives this, meaning um, the fact that um, whiteness defines um, what is normative, all right? And, and, and again, it, it is only when we are willing to say, well, this is how we have done things for a number of years, but does it have to be done this way? Um, applying that critical lens, um, it is only when we engage in that kind of behavior that we can begin to uncover um, these shortcomings and then move affirmatively to try to address them. Absolutely, and questioning their assumptions, um, as Harvey said, I mean, we, we just uh, assume what to be, quote, normal, which is actually not, it's white, um, that we need to question the assumptions under which we operate, really to interrogate uh, a lot of the, the structures and policies that we currently utilize. And so any of you who are listening, if you're in a position to do that, um, really encourage that. And then on an individual level, really seek out to understand more from different perspectives, um, to listen deeply and seek out those perspectives and listen deeply to others beyond your own likeness bubble. Um, and, and when in places of discomfort, lean into wonder, turn to wonder as opposed to defensiveness to say, hmm, I wonder why I'm feeling this way right now, or hmm, I wonder what might be behind, uh, you know, what, what this other person is really going through. I wanna understand more. So really using that wonder, that curiosity, as opposed to reacting in defensiveness um, and really seeking more to understand. Um, and that's really an important piece, again, to kind of live out daily uh, in, in our lives as we go through each day. Um, I know that the audience is very keen to get uh, concrete examples of initiatives that can be done. And let me quickly yeah. offer a few um, and, and, and say, say, say some other things. Um, the first is that um, internships, and in fact, we made reference to this in the article um, that Darla and I wrote. Uh, you know, a number of institutions are actually literally next door to communities of color. And yet there is very little interaction between students on the campus and these communities. And it's as if we almost believe that um, uh, students can achieve a more worthwhile education if we send them 5,000 miles away to a different country um, to engage in service learning or volunteer work um, or some aspect of, of internships and not even consider the possibility that students can engage in meaningful learning, in transformative learning in the communities 
that are in close proximity to where uh, the home institution is located. So that's um, something that um, um, international educator, education professionals ought to consider, the sites for learning, internships and so on. Um, and this can be a way of helping students to um, uh, engage with, with issues of racism and learn skills around anti-racism. Um, I should have mentioned this first, but the curriculum, I think, mm. ought to drive all of the learning that really happens. So, you know, to the extent that folks are able to work with faculty, to work with academic departments in articulating not just learning outcomes, but global learning outcomes, and global learning outcomes that actually into, um, um, embrace or is integrated with um, anti-racism. Um, interestingly, the, um, the, the print, the frame print that you see behind me is actually um, uh, uh, the result of a class project at Northern Arizona University in, in art, where um, students were asked to um, do this project where they, they, were, they were actually integrating the three elements of global learning that we had articulated there. Um, sustainability, diversity, and global engagement. And students actually used uh, trash, basically, to put together what I thought was an amazing um, uh, image, uh, so much so that I had to get a copy myself. Um, and so uh, when uh, we work with faculty in developing global learning outcomes, we can actually help them to, um, to transform the, the courses they teach and even the outcomes for um, disciplines and academic departments to speak to this important work. Now, if you're a study abroad advisor, you might be saying, well, you know, I can't really do this um, as, a, as, a, as a study abroad advisor, but maybe your SIO can do it, your senior international officer. And when there are opportunities to engage in institution-wide strategic planning, you know, try to create a space for yourself so you can influence the conversation as to what um, the, the, the university priorities for the next five, 10 years should look like and create a space for conversation around internationalization. A couple more I would share with you. Um, Co-sponsoring events that address issues of, of race. And on this particular score, I, I, I think that, um, um, you know, there are many white professionals who feel very uncomfortable standing up and denouncing racism or standing in solidarity with, with uh, anti-racist efforts. But I'd like to point out to you that one of the reasons that the George Floyd murder earlier this year was such, um, a, has proven to be such an inflection point in our country is because a lot of white people, a lot of young white people stood shoulder to shoulder with their black peers and counterparts and allies in saying, this is not acceptable. And of course, within the context of a racist society where white supremacy dominates, the only way that you can dismantle these structures or the only people who can dismantle these structures are white people. Let, we have to accept that. And so, you know, this is in a way my call to white international educators to stop assuming that um, conversations around race need to be led only by people of color. They are just as much your responsibility. And in fact, as white professionals, you can have a lot more success and efficacy in combating the scourge of our planet and our country when you speak up. Because keep in mind, black people have been screaming about this for four centuries. Not a whole lot has, has happened. It is only when white allies come forward and say, this is not acceptable. We need to bring about a change and sustainable change. Um, we can expect to see this happen. So collaborating with faculty of color on various programming um, initiatives on the campus and even co-sponsoring um, programming to do this work is, is a very tangible strategy that can be embraced uh, by uh, educators. And Harvey, if I could pick up on that, I, I think you're absolutely 
Thank you so much for that challenge to white educators that this is not uh, a problem that that those uh, black and, and others of color need to address because this was created by white people and white people need to step up and do a lot more than what currently is being done. Um, and, and, and also to your point about the curriculum, uh, research studies and Karen, you've probably seen this too in some of the work you've done, Research studies show that curriculum is such a key piece of internationalization efforts and kind of in tandem with that, the role of faculty in internationalization efforts. So to that end, and, and we recognize that international education professionals may not have direct access in the classroom, but they, they can partner with, as you said, partner with faculty, look at what can we do together to really look, take a hard look at what does it mean to quote internationalize the curriculum and ask really hard questions and help facilitate those conversations about, again, whose voices are missing, whose knowledge is being privileged, what examples are given. Do young people see themselves, do the students see themselves in the curriculum or not? And, and uh, there was a, um, a movie that just came out recently called Critical Thinking that was very much about uh, young students seeing themselves or not in what is being taught. And so what examples are being given and what resources are being cited and so on. And so really taking a hard look at that and even to the assessments we use and looking at the bias and the assessments that are being used in the, in the coursework and so on. Um, so that's really important piece to, to, you know, maybe to bring people together to discuss and look at. And at my institution, um, we did uh, have a fair amount of success in bringing faculty together in a working group to read articles and discuss together. And, and we found that this is, it works much better than quote training faculty through workshops, but, um, but really bringing them to, meeting them where they are with kind of more at the academic level, facilitating those conversations. And, and this continued uh, throughout the entire semester and uh, when reading articles and discussing together with faculty from across the campus, from different departments. And then um, in the following semester, we actually invited authors of those articles that we read to come and, and, and be part of um, discussions together. And, and certainly now in this time of COVID, that can happen like we are doing now uh, virtually as well. So there are ways to, to go about doing that. One other um, really exciting effort that is happening actually around the world is a project from, from the United Nations, from UNESCO, that is very implementable in, in classrooms and also in the co-curriculum. And that is uh, an intercultural methodology called Story Circles. And again, it's, it's inspired by indigenous traditions. A lot of the quote intercultural training is coming more out of the white dominant culture uh, traditions and, and this is really emerging more and inspired by indigenous uh, cultures from around the world. And, and um, it's, it's a way to have participants really practice uh, these intercultural skills, particularly around listening for understanding. And that's a really key skill that we could all practice more. I think that oftentimes as humans, it's normal for us to listen for response or listen for judgment. And whenever we're doing that, the focus is actually more on ourselves. How am I going to respond to you? What do I think about what you're saying? But with the listening for understanding, it's really focusing 100% on who's talking and, and really hearing them, understanding what they're saying, how they're saying it, what they're not saying, um, the nonverbals and so on. So through story circles, participants get to practice that. And we have used this with faculty, with students. Um, it's, it's really amazing also at trying to bridge divides and really hearing perspectives that we might not normally have the opportunity to hear. And I'm happy to, to share more about that for those who are interested. I would say um, it's available as an open access manual that's downloadable and available in five languages. So, um, and, and UNESCO wants this to be used as widely as possible. And while it started off as an in-person way to do this and actually use this at my institution to bring international and domestic students together. And I wrote about that in the IIE Networker this spring about the experience of that. So you can read that article as well. Um, we are now using it virtually. I use it in classes I teach. We use it outside of classes as well as to really connect students much more deeply which is so important in this time of isolation and separation and just uh, these little bits of that we see on the screen um, th that participants are really amazed at how deeply they're able to connect with each other through story circles. And Darla, I don't know, I don't want, 
I don't assume that you can recite the URL at the top of your head, but would there be a, a good way for people if they want, if they're interested to search for this and find it pretty quickly? Yes, and I can, I don't know how many people access the chat. I can try to put the link there. They're um, not in the chat actually, in, in oh, our chat okay. is the problem. Okay. Yeah, if, if you search for UNESCO. Um, but if you actually, a, Darla, if you put it in the chat, um, uh, I think maybe Jenna could do it, so. Okay, that'd yeah, be great. Yeah, if you search for manual on developing intercultural competencies, colon story circles, you'll actually find it on Amazon. It, it, you, uh, it is available as a hard copy, but you don't have to get it this way. You can just download it. And it's in Spanish, French, uh, Russian, English, and Arabic um, right now with maybe more languages come. And, and UNESCO is using it um, around the world within communities also. And we, I've used it in my local community to actually, um, a nonprofit is using it now and they're using it every week to bring together specifically white and black um, citizens to really be able to listen deeply to each other. And it's just so exciting to see how this is going out into the community now. And that, that would be another piece I would say is that we need to look at ways to get our students and ourselves beyond our academic bubble. How are we engaging in the local communities, whether it's through service learning, volunteering, or just getting engaged? What are we doing to engage in, in, with others in the local community? I think that's one of the big issues in this country that there's so many divides and academics tend to just stay with academics and then within higher education. We have to go beyond that. How are we getting out there? How are we really truly engaging? And, and, and that is part of our challenge also. Karen, can I offer two additional um, um, examples of things that can be done? Um, the first is um, orientation. And of mm -hmm. course, um, international educators do orientation every semester. Orientations for new international students and orientations for students going on study abroad programs. And these are perfect sites for a conversation on issues of race or anti-racism. Um, and if you feel that you simply aren't uh, knowledgeable enough or, or whatever to, um, to grapple with this issue within the context of an orientation, reach out to your partner, the chief diversity officer or someone in that staff and invite them to come and address these kinds of issues for you. And you know, I think that it would be wise to go beyond anti-racism and talk about other forms of inequality because um, American students going to uh, countries around the world will in fact encounter other forms of, of, of inequality and they will need some tools to navigate those uh, experiences when they encounter them. So that's, that's an important thing that um, can be done and, and should be um, doable fairly easily. Um, the other um, um, item I would mention has to do with the grand challenges or some of you may know it as the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, the first point I'd make about that is that these goals will never be realized within the context of inequality. It is only as we attempt to combat and reduce inequality and racism do we have a shot really at fulfilling these goals. Racism, inequality, actually compromises our efforts around um, overcoming or winning these grand challenges. Um, but on your campus, uh, you can actually support students in uh, research projects um, along with faculty members on these grand challenges. And you, know, you can articulate it in such a way so that uh, faculty would be interested and motivated to do this, and, um, and students will realize that, that this is an opportunity for, for them to learn things and have experiences that they otherwise might not have. Um, if you have resources, and this is a, a very difficult thing to say in this uh, current pandemic and the economic the devastation that uh, thousands of colleges and universities are dealing with, but to the extent that you're able to redeploy some resources within your budget, and it really doesn't have to be a whole lot of money. 
um, you know, faculty engage in this work because they love doing this work. They love working with students. Um, use these resources to, 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 to fund, to help fund faculty and student collaboration on issues that have to do with the grand challenges. And then at the end of the academic year or close to the end, you could organize a, a, a research symposium that looks at research that focused on grand global challenges. And again, this would be an opportunity for students to report on the important work that they have done. I was able to do this uh, research symposium and every year I had more students than I, could, than I could actually accommodate because there was so much interest in doing this. Another point I'd like to make, believe it or not, that these kinds of initiatives have a way of attracting students of color. Um, and I was able to see that firsthand. Um, so, you know, these are things that must be done. These are lessons that must be learned. These are issues with which our students must become familiar. And to the extent that we create these opportunities for students to get involved, I think we can realize a whole lot of success, not only dealing with grand challenges that we face as a planet, but also dealing with issues of inequality and racism. And speaking of racism, uh, some of you all might know that, that AAC and you has been working on developing centers for truth, racial healing and transformation, TRHT centers. There are now at least 25 around the country and they aim to develop 150 more uh, at least. And these centers really try to address um, what's called hierarchies of human value and how to flatten those hierarchies. Um, and one of the centerpieces of these um, centers is RX racial healing circles. And I am thankful that the, at Duke University has a TRHT center and I've, I've been able to be involved with um, the work of RX racial healing circles. So if, I would encourage you and I can put this link in the chat as well and it can be shared to look to see if there are, there's a TRHT center near you or if your university might be able to to, to come together to actually develop one. Um, but there's a lot that can be learned again from bringing people together. And this, and I've learned so much through this work uh, of the RX racial healing circles of really coming together and listening, truly listening to each other's experiences and sharing deeply uh, with each other. And, and students are involved, faculty involved, staff are involved, it's just, and community members. So it's just an amazing way to get so many different persons involved, uh, again, across these, these divides and, and really try to work then in the end toward racial healing. So it's, it's about taking action and making these, these, these long-term commitments uh, as we continue to do this work every day. I mean, obviously, we're talking here about times in which, you know, Harvey, you've, you've been the convener and sort of the, the accelerant of some of these things. Sometimes it's a matter of tapping in and, and saying, look here, yes, we're the international office and you might not think about us in these diversity conversations, but please, we want, to, we want in on this conversation. But I'm, I've, had an, I've seen in the questions a number of people ask, what do I do if my institution as a whole just doesn't even recognize that this is a problem? I mean, how would, do you have any advice about how people start that conversation then if people are like, oh, we're, we're not, you know, to your point, or Darla, oh, we're not having issues with race on our campus. Well, um, you know, I think that strategic planning is really the perfect venue to begin a conversation like this. And, um, uh, because strategic, uh, a strategic planning process mm -hmm. creates a space for you to basically throw whatever you want to on the table. Now, um, the challenge is to convince enough people in the strategic planning committee that this is worth serious consideration and the, the, the institution should adopt it. But I would argue that the timing has maybe never been better for, um, institutions to embrace a commitment to um, anti-racist education, given what has transpired over the, the past few months. Take advantage um, of and, crisis. Yes, basically. absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, one of the interesting things that have happened this year is that the, the three or four crises that we have faced are all global in nature, including the crisis around race um, and racial protests. Um, and so, you know, in a way, we have the perfect argument 
to offer um, in terms of advocating for an embrace of internationalization at the same time as we can advocate for an embrace of anti-racist education. And yes, um, I, am, I have been around long enough to know that there are some institutions that would be fine simply settling for an agenda that's all about window dressing. But yet there are many other institutions that would be willing to go to do a lot more than that. And actually the institutions that really succeed, are, are not, it's not about the statements that they make or the strategic priorities that they adopt ultimately. It is about the people, the professionals who say, this matters to me as a person, as a professional, and this matters to my institution, and I will invest the time and effort to support this agenda. So um, convincing our institutions to do this work, I think we can best do that within the context of strategic planning. And folks, strategic planning occurs much more often than we, we might realize. It happens maybe when a strategic plan has come to its end or it happens when a new president or a new provost is hired. And guess what? Even if um, the institution-wide strategic planning process is not available to you, you can engage with your senior international officer, assuming that you're not one, and say, maybe we should launch a strategic planning process focused on campus internationalization. And so within that context, we have an opportunity to have this conversation. And I have to tell you, there will be instances where a chief diversity officer might be actually a bit leery as to what you're proposing. I mean, I remember about 12 years ago um, um, launching this initiative at, at an institution and um, the, the folks in the diversity, equity and inclusion office actually saw um, this agenda as, a, as, as a, a Trojan horse to subsume and marginalize the work that they had done around diversity and inclusion. And I had to spend a lot of time trying to convince them. And initially I wasn't very successful, but after two, three years, as the plan played out, the internationalization plan played out, which by the way, included a diversity component because it has to, um, they were able to realize that the internationalization strategic plan actually supported their efforts around diversity and inclusion. And back yeah, to and sorry, sorry, back to the earlier point also is it, it, with strategic planning or, or in trying to move an institution forward that doesn't seem to be there yet. It comes back to also the partnerships and, and looking at who can we partner with, who are the champions. There has to be someone at the institution who can feel similarly and who can champion this work and, and, and then together and kind of building that up, being able to move it forward. And students don't underestimate the role of students in all of this, that, that we can really work with and through our students also. Um, oftentimes they are further along in this journey than we are. And we have a lot to learn from our students too. So looking at how can we engage others together to move this forward. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Earl. I think in many ways, students are driving a lot of these, these very conversations on, on campus. Um, I wanted just very briefly to kind of go just a little bit more focused on the, the international component of, of this. And I just wanted to ask a little bit, I mean, I know, um, you know, I talked with a lot of international students, particularly when the protests were happening. Um, and some of them um, had, had very much educated themselves. And um, I think we're a little frustrated because they had come, they were coming from different cultures and different countries in which the language around racism was just not as familiar to them as it is to, to those of us here. And I wonder if there are any um, programming or particular um, approaches that you think are promising specifically to be talking with international students and educating them about issues of race. Because my experience was many of these students wanted to be part of the conversation, wanted to be part of the solution. And sometimes it was, they didn't even feel like they were, had the, the language to take part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know that I can cite um, existing programs that um, international educators can pull off, pull, uh, off a, a shelf and, and deploy to help uh, students like this. However, um, I think the responsibility that we have as international educators is twofold. 
One, to help students understand issues of race in the American context, because international students are here. They're spending time here. And in a way, this is part of their education. All right, so they, they are negotiating life in the communities in which they live every day. And um, if, if they look like a person of color, there is no question, they will have experiences um, that might be um, really intimidating and even traumatizing. And if, if, if we do not help them figure out what this phenomenon is all about and how best to negotiate it, in some ways we're failing in our responsibility. Um, but in, 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 in another uh, respect, we can help them to uncover forms of inequality. And it's not necessarily about race, but forms of inequality that exist in their countries of origin. And um, they might actually be in a position to speak um, quite compellingly about those issues. And that could be an excellent way of helping them to come to terms with the phenomenon of racism, which as I've said before, is an element or one manifestation of inequality. Um, so, you know, orientation programs where we can, um, we can address these topics in a very formal kind of way, but other kinds of programming that could be done through student organizations. And it doesn't have to be the international student organization, but we can, we can, um, um, in, in, encourage international students to attend student programming or other programming on the campus, a guest speak, speaker coming or a film being shown where they can be educated on these issues. Yeah, I would say too, I, I know Karen exactly. I have had some of the same experiences with international students, sometimes not understanding at all, having so many questions. They want to ask, you know, what, what is this? Why, why is this happening? What's the context behind it? There and some so of many, them are experiencing racism, frankly. And they're experiencing right? it. And, yep. and then too often, I think international offices don't address this um, in ways that are helpful and needed. And so I, I would encourage international education professionals not to shy away from addressing this, to, as Harvey said, provide those opportunities for programming, right? You know, create those brave spaces to bring people together to really uh, let's talk about it, let's address it, um, and let's let's talk a little bit like what we're doing today about what are the issues, what are the questions, and then also encouraging participation in in other resources on campus. For example, even safe zone trainings, and have you know how many international students participate in that? Um, other kinds of opportunities that are available, making them aware of those and encouraging their participation to kind of broaden uh, their perspective. On, on what they're experiencing here in the United States. Um, I know we have just a couple of minutes left. Um, amazingly, it's, it's been an hour and, and, and it's really ticking down. I, I wanted just to ask, um, you know, just to circle back to your, your where you both began, which is to say, this is a constant um, evolution. This is a constant sort of educational experience. Um, I wonder if, if how how you both have been doing with this, how you're feeling, you know, this is a tough time. How, how have you been continuing your own sort of anti-racist education? Yeah, thank you so much for, for asking that, Karen. And I think it's, for me, it's been a time of um, continued growth and learning. Um, I feel like it's important to keep learning of, of seeking out. I've been trying to be in conversation intentionally with, um, with others in trying to understand their perspectives and also seeking out um, more, more that I can do, for example, um, from different other perspectives outside the US. Um, I've been drawn to this concept of Ubuntu from South Africa that's looking at, we're, it's not us as an individual, but I am because we are, we are because I am, we are part of each other and what we do impacts each other. Um, and, and to that end, I, there is a, a book by um, Desmond Tutu's granddaughter that I've been engaged in a, in, in a uh, book uh, discussion on um, called Everyday Ubuntu. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's uh, the subtitle of Living Better Together the African Way and looking at concrete things we can do every day um, in, in trying to, to understand we're all part of this together. And then I've been drawn and reading more about um, Martin Luther King's um, vision of the beloved community, one where social justice and equity reigns and is part of it. And what can we do to build the beloved community and really thinking of each other more in terms of neighbors we are all neighbors to each other local and global and what does that really mean 
And so these are questions I've been asking myself and wrestling with um, as I continue to engage in some of the work with story circles and racial healing circles and so on. But I think it's just so important to keep learning every day. And, and ultimately, uh, I re remain inspired by Martin Luther King's uh, quote that we must learn to live together. This is not an option. We must learn to live together as brothers, as family, or perish together as fools. And I think that quote has never been truer today. <laughs> and, 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 and we as, as white people, of those who are in, in, in positions of privilege and power need to really step up and, and interrogate and take action around systems uh, and policies of oppression. And, and it's really on us to do that. And so, um, yeah, I'm just grateful for this opportunity to be able to be in conversation with, with all of you and, and um, remain inspired to continue to, to work every day in this. And of course, um, I speak not as a white man, but as a black man um, uh, and to say that, you know, I have had my own evolution as well. Um, you know, because learning needs to happen across the board. You know, I experience uh, the deleterious effects of racism because I am a person of color. But that doesn't mean that I know everything about racism. And so this experience has pushed me to read a bit more, um, to learn more. Actually, my, my wife is a sociologist and she teaches on this topic. And we've, ha we've been having conversations that, um, in some ways uh, is an extension of what we used to have, but, but an, at an even deeper level. Um, and, and so, um, and I believe that these new insights can be deployed in constructive ways within the field of international education. And this is why Darla and I wrote the article, for example, you know, you may not find me on Main Street in Albany protesting, but I, I feel very deeply that I have to make a contribution uh, to this issue. I have to um, um, work at deconstructing um, um, the, 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 uh, what, this, what this means for the field of international education and, um, and establish alliances with my colleagues within this field to ensure that we can pursue a path of institutionalizing anti-racism within the work of internationalization. It, 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 it is a given, it is fairly obvious, it has to be a part of it. So, and therefore, because of that, I don't think that we have a whole lot of difficulty in necessarily making the case. It is about committing ourselves to do this important work. Um, and I am thrilled that this space has opened up uh, so that we can have these kinds of conversations and look at this, th this issue in more critical ways. Yeah, and it's going to be tough work. And I think sometimes that's hard to do because, you know, it doesn't have immediate payoff or, you know, outcome. And I, I think, um, you know, recognizing that and, and mm -hmm. committing to it is, is probably very important. Um, we, I want to apologize. We had so many questions. We could have gone really deep in, in so many directions and we just only had the hour. But I, I think, um, I don't want to speak too much for Darla and, and Harvey, but I, I think there's a lot of interest in continuing this conversation. I know that they will be probably continuing to write about it as will I, um, both in the Chronicle um, and in my weekly uh, global education newsletter. And so I'd love to hear about the, the things, the challenges that you all are wrestling with on your campuses, the solutions and the, the, the promising approaches that you're coming. I, I think we all learn a lot from one another. Um, before I go, I just want to tell you all um, again that this has been recorded, so you, can, you will be able to listen to it back again, um, because I, I know there was so much information that, you know, I know I want to, um, but I also want to just mention um, that Berkeley, um, the Center for Studies in Higher Education, will be hosting um, another webinar um, next week on November 9th at 11 a.m. Pacific, and that's on um, the issues of student debt, really kind of delving into what are the, what's the rhetoric and what's what's really the the challenges in it and so um i would encourage you to to look on their homepage too if, if that would be interesting to you um so thanks um darla and harvey and margaret i'll turn it back over to you uh no i just want to thank all three of you really warmly because this is it's really opened up all kinds of ideas for me that I want to discuss with you further, to be honest. That that book of yours, uh, the manual, 
Darla is very good. I, I read it before this session and, and Harvey, your articles, fabulous. We have to continue this conversation. This is worthwhile. This is, we are breaking new ground here. You have really done that. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. But we need to continue the conversation. And the action. And the action. <laughs> yes, Darla, you're absolutely right. But there's possibilities that have emerged here that I don't think have been sufficiently investigated or, or tried out. Let's do that. Let's see what we can do on an ongoing basis. Thank you again. This is really, really important. Thank you. And thank you, Karen, for your help. Thank you very much.